Hello students, this is Alan Boris from the Anthropology Lab at Kenai Peninsula College. And this is the second part of the lecture on the early history uh, of the Cook Inlet area. History meaning in this sense, the written record. So we brought Captain Cook into Cook Inlet and Spaniards and Russians and interactions with Denina and now uh, that was the first lecture so this is the continuing lecture of that uh, story and we're going on to talk about a very significant event in my opinion in Cook Inlet the Battle of Kenai uh, and by Battle of Kenai we mean Kenai in the general sense uh, one battle taking place at this fort at Redoubt St. Nicholas at the mouth of the Kenai River, other battles taking place in Tyonic and in Iliamna and perhaps other places as well. So this is one of the several Russian posts. Redoubt, you recall, is a term for a fort, uh, meaning it had a palisade around it. This palisade was described by Vancouver as having uh, being of, of spruce. He actually says pine, but they were spruce with sharpened poles at the top. And about, I think he said about 12 to 16 feet tall. These were not military forts, however. These were merchant forts. The Russian military had little or no presence in Alaska. A few officers came, but uh, regular garrisons did not come. These were forts of a merchant militia uh, and uh, to protect their fur trading operations. So we will go on and we will discuss uh, the Battle of Kenai. So again, to review, uh, this is a map, uh, 1802 map, a uh, Russian map. Uh, this particular one is in the uh, uh, National Archives. Pardon me, this was in the Library of Congress. And uh, unless you read Russian, it's, it's hard, but uh, Kenai is here. Uh, the post at uh, St. George does not appear because by this time it was likely abandoned. Uh, the post down at Nanwalik is here and the other post. So Russia, Russia by this time was filling in the gaps but still largely coastal and up the Kuskokwim River. Uh, not a lot of knowledge of the interior of Alaska and as we will mention later the Russians did not control all of the territory you see here. The Russians controlled uh, a few acres around each post. The rest was sovereign territory of the indigenous groups. So to set the stage, uh, you recall in the earlier lecture we talked about fur trading companies that formed, uh, shares were sold. Uh, raising capital to build a ship, to hire a crew, to send to the Aleutians, and further on to har harvest sea otter, uh, bring the sea otter back where it was uh, marketed uh, uh, through uh, interior Russia and China into China, the sea otter being the fur of cho choice in China, at which point uh, shares were paid off and the company disbanded and a new company was formed so with new shares. Now these regular shareholders, if they made money, they reinvested in a new company and so on. With the land-based um, corporate structure that Shelikov envisioned, uh, this same corporate organization was retained. So here's uh, St. George Redoubt which was at the mouth of the Kasilov River. The ship sailed in 1783. The redoubt was established at the mouth of uh, the Kasilov in 1787. Um, and these are the shareholders. Uh, Lebedev Lashtokin, Pavel Lebedev Lashtokin, had 34 shares, so he's the primary shareholder in the company. And these are the other shareholders. They didn't come to Alaska. They didn't work. They just invested 
and uh, the, this was managed by Peter Gollum and so these people on down did come to Alaska and Steven Zykoff was the captain and so on and there were 67 crew. The crew was paid on the basis of the total shares, the total take of furs that the company um, uh, collected. And here's the uh, readout St. Nicholas. Uh, also, Labette of Lestoken had primary shares in this. So remember, this is only 12, 15 miles north of the previous post. It was established in 1791. Um, and here's uh, the shareholders, which included, by the way, Gregory Shelikoff. So Shelikoff had was primary shareholder in the post at English Bay at Nanwalik on the southern peninsula. I don't have their corporate structure here. I haven't found it yet, but uh, he would have been the primary shareholder there. And I don't know, 10, 15 other shareholders involved. Same situation. And then here there were 97 men involved. Uh, and they would be paid on the basis of the total take after the shareholders are paid off. So in effect, these two companies, though they were both Lebedive Lastoken companies, were competitors. On the sea otter trade on the open ocean, this would not have been an issue because they were in mobile boats and they would have simply found a place where nobody else was to collect sea otter through the Aleut hunters and but on once on shore then they became more direct competitors uh, and that's an important part of the story and to know that Shelikov as an investor I mean he wins both ways he wins if uh, if if this company doesn't make a lot of money this one uh, the, his his company in English Bay may uh, Labette of Lestoken wins both ways. These are competitors. If, uh, if this company doesn't make a lot of money, he'll make it out of this one. Given that there are limited uh, sea otter resources in Cook Inlet. Cook Inlet is not prime sea otter country. The Aleutians, southeast Alaska, but not Cook Inlet. Southern Cook Inlet to a certain extent, but not upper Cook Inlet where these posts were. There are other individuals. Uh, this is Sharpkin. He had shares in both companies. Uh, here's uh, Kuz Kuznetov. Kuznetov. There we go. Uh, that's probably his brother here. There's Arseny, and here's uh, Ivan, Ivan. So uh, there's a lot of interconnectedness in these shareholders back in Russia. But the point I want to make is these were competing companies, even though they may have had the same leader, the same primary shareholder. So here's the structure. So recall the Denina uh, uh, redistributive system. So here's a Denina village. They collect resources by the through the clan helpers, the Ukilka. Uh, the Geshka controls those resources and redistributes the food back to the people on a need basis. So in the fur trade, a, a fort would ally with a particular village through the Geshka. The Geshka would uh, elicit from his clan helpers furs. Those furs, uh, sea otter but also other furs, would go to the Russians in exchange for trade goods. Trade goods like knives, beads, cloth, things of that nature that would go back to the Geshka and he would redistribute those back to his clan helpers for more furs. And the furs then go to the Russian. The trade goods go back uh, to the Geshka, to the people. So the Russians themselves were not actually hunting sea otter or other fur, getting furs in most cases. And this alliance was an important alliance. So over here I've diagrammed another one. This would be another fort. This was, we'll make this one Kenai and this one Kasilov, for example. Even though they were both owned by Labette of Lestoken, they were, uh, or who was the primary shareholder, 
they were competing with one another. So same situation. And the geshka in both cases becomes the critical factor in the trade. So given limited sea otter, limited food, uh, sea uh, fur resources, the, the more you get here, the less they get here, and vice versa. So what emerged were subversive acts. Uh, a fort, maybe not the leader of the fort, but maybe the leader, encouraging or creating subversive acts toward the Geshka allied with the opposite post to try to limit their take in furs to maximize your take in furs and vice versa. So all three posts were undoubtedly involved in this. The one at English Bay at Nanwalik, one at Kasilov, the one at Kenai, and this was highly disruptive to the Denina. I'll show you in a bit the attacks on the Geshkas, beatings, um, sometimes rape of women, of wives, other things. The second uh, and third upsetting thing for the Denina was the taking of Denina women as concubines. Denina women were said to be the most beautiful to European eyes of the native women of Alaska and uh, and so they were attractive for uh, sexual purposes. I've included this picture of a Denina woman at the mouth of the Kasilov taken in the 1890s. Uh, this was not taken during Russian era times. This was, I just put her here to illustrate the point. So Denina women were taken, some possibly as uh, willingly, some possibly unwillingly, uh, some as young as 10 years old. And that's documented by Russian priests, Orthodox priests, who condemned the act uh, of taking Denina women, uh, sometimes several, holding them as uh, for sex and, I suppose, companionship. Uh, in addition, and I didn't know how to illustrate this, but there's at least one instance in Iliamna of child molestation. Russian leaders, uh, Russian uh, head, m molesting a Denina uh, child. And uh, all of these were, um, were horrific to the Denina and planted the seeds of dissension that were to result in this all coming to a head in 1797. Here are some of the grim statistics. I took some time a few years ago to document uh, what we could call a chronology of violence. This being Russian toward Denina. Uh, and the approximate date and the approximate number of people assaulted, killed, kidnapped, uh, or, uh, or, or otherwise threatened. Involves Geshka, uh, involves, uh, involves women, and uh, here's page two. Same thing. And this uh, is the uh, retaliatory acts of Denina toward Russians. Uh, for example, here, Iliamna Denina kill numerous Russians for mistreatment of their children. Uh, Fifteen or so killed. It's about an, it's an estimate. It was the numbers aren't aren't clear. They'll say sometimes killed all of the Russians. And so this is an approximation. But it's just to give an idea of the nature of the conflict that was emerging in Cook Inlet at that time. This uh, is a story of Jadakul youth, which uh, sort of illustrates some of the conflict, but also to point out that the conflict was not entirely protagonist-antagonist. Jadakul youth was from the Skilak Lake area, probably from Stepanka's area right here, which is a traditional Denina place. Uh, could have been up uh, in the Skilantnu area, up further up here in this area. Uh, but either way, he, wherever he was from, he and his uncle were traveling down to the post at Kenai, right here, 
to trade uh, trade furs for trade goods. There had been some sort of an earlier attack in Kenai, so the Russians were on edge. As Jadakuliuth and his uncle approached, a sentry in one of the bastions shot and killed his uncle dead. Um, no provocation. Uh, Jadakuliuth was enraged. He put his uncle's body nearby, uh, it says on a small hill. And he went upriver. We don't know how far upriver. I'll just randomly take this spot right here. Where uh, there were two parties of Russians that were cutting logs, cutting poles for the post. So that tells me it was during the time that the post in Kenai was being built. It was established in 1791, rebuilt in 1794. So it's somewhere in that time period. Um, Jadakul youth goes up, so it's at night, the Russians go to sleep. They have two sentries. The sentries call back and forth to one another, uh, some sort of all is clear, whatever. Jadakul youth times the calls. Uh, he slits the throat of the first one. He then goes over and slits the throat of the second one and then proceeds to kill as many as he can before the rest wake up gets in his kayak, goes back down river, past the Russian fort, which it's at night, and goes um, down Cook Inlet. It doesn't say how far. It says something in the Kasilov area. We'll just make them randomly here. It's possible he could have gone up the river to Tustamina Lake as well. The commander at Kenai threatens retaliation. Uh, by that time, it was not Gregor Gonovalov, although it could have been, uh, it's not entirely clear when he was transferred over to um, Prince William Sound. Uh, I think Zykov was probably in charge by that time. We'll say it was Zykov, and Zykov threatens retaliation for the killing of his men. And uh, the Denina people know where Jadakul youth is. They go and they tell of the threatened uh, retaliation. Jadakul youth takes a steam steam bath, Nelle, uh, purifying agent, purifying action, and goes back up to the to the beach in front of the post at Kenai to turn himself in. Uh, he only asks one thing. He asks to sing his death song, and he does. Uh, the commander asks him why he did what he did, and he uh, explains that his uncle was shot with no provocation and shows him his body. Jada, uh, the commander is impressed with Jadakuliu's uh, bravery, and he lets him go does not do anything to Jadakul youth himself. Uh, at the same time, uh, this might be a noble act but on both parts, but uh, also he may have been the commander, Sykoff or whoever it was, may have been trying to suppress any further uh, hostilities from the Denina because things were undoubtedly very tense. So those are some of the situations, some of the actions that uh, that happened. So what we have emerging is a number of factions. We have the Russian traders, we have the traditional Denina, and we have Russians allied with uh, Russian allied Denina, who are allied this way. Uh, these three factions, and uh, so uh, these would be. Denina, who were generally more accepting, uh, less angered by the events, and uh, probably more accepting of the trade that was possible. Uh, and these would be the traditional ones. These would be uh, angered uh, by the Russian trader actions toward their Gishka, toward their women, and angered toward the Denina, who tended to side with the Russians. Things came to a head in 1797. Uh, in no particular sequence, uh, first uh, at Iliamna, uh, the entire contingent of Russians there at the Artel were said to have been killed by the Denina. At Tyonik, 
a similar situation where all of the Ru uh, Russians at the Tyonic Artel were killed. And at Kenai, uh, the battle uh, occurred here at my humble rendition of the fort at Kenai. Read out, uh, read out St. Nicholas with the Kenai River in the background. The um, attack involved on the Russian part uh, muskets, pistols, and cannons. Cannons were uh, not allowed for anyone but the military, but Catherine the Great gave the American companies dispensation to have cannons. They would have been sort of like the Scud missiles of the time. No one, not everyone could just own a Scud missile, could own a cannon. But to protect them or uh, for whatever activities, the Russians were given uh, ownership. This is actually a cannon uh, at, at Fort Ross in California. I'll show you a picture of Fort Ross in a moment. Uh, this is an actual part of a cannon, or maybe mortar is the right term, uh, here it, found in Kenai. So this could have been the actual one involved in the battle. And these are just random muskets and pistols off the internet that uh, I put to illustrate the tools of war that the Russians had. And um, this is what the Denina had. They had armor. We talked about the uh, rabbit fur sand with pitch armor the Denina head which were thought to be able to at least at some distance stop a musket ball and they had these tools these uh, oil soaked antler clubs this one tipped with obsidian this one the obsidian's gone but it would have been tipped as well that uh, would have been used in hand-to-hand -hand fighting so the Denina somehow entered the gate. So we don't have a lot of details of the battle. Um, there's a, a second famous battle that occurred uh, one, three, four years later, 1801, I believe it's 1801, maybe 1802, in Sitka, the Battle of Sitka, which if you've taken Russian history, you've probably read about or were told about. Uh, in that battle, the Tlingit defeated the Russian post that was newly established at Sitka. Uh, we wouldn't know much about that either had it not been for the presence of an Ru American ship in the harbor in Sitka. And so the American commander wrote about it. Um, and so it becomes much more famous. There was no American ship, uh, neutral observer, in the harbor to watch the Battle of Kenai as it unfolded. Uh, at the fort, so we don't have all the details. Uh, but it is known that the Denina made it inside the gate. So once the pistols go off, once the muskets go off, uh, once the cannons go off, um, this becomes the preferable tool. It takes about a minute and a half to load a, a musket, and uh, once entering the Denina head the advent. And they won. The Denina won. The battle took place in the fall of 1797. In the spring of 1798, the Lebedev Company abandoned the post. All 90-some men went back to Russia. Uh, the Shelikov, or part, yeah, Shelikov Company, uh, through Malakoff, uh, took over the post, but only stationed a small number of men there. And presumably some of the hostile actions of Russians toward Denina, Denina women, and uh, toward Geshka ceased. And for the Denina, this was the best uh, of both worlds. They were able to retain access to trade goods, but also to eliminate the um, terrible actions perpetrated against them. At least things settled down in the documents. So there were uh, significant consequences of this at the time, uh, or at least shortly thereafter. Uh, Alexander Baranov, who was the now sole leader, sole head, because he was at the Shelikov Company, soon to be re reorganized as the Russian America Company, 
uh, was given charge to find a mainland capital, to establish a mainland capital. Uh, he uh, briefly did a, uh, a failed agricultural experiment at Yakutat, I guess right here somewhere. Uh, it didn't work because the people, the Russians there, did not know enough about agriculture to make that work. So that pulled out. The Lebedev company had pulled out. So he has had essentially two options to establish a mainland capital site. One was on the Kenai Peninsula Cook Inlet area, and the other in southeast. Uh, each had advantages and disadvantages, but I believe that because of the recent Battle of Kenai, uh, uh, Baranov was influenced to establish a post somewhere in southeast, which he then did at Sitka. And as we know, that uh, that was just as they were just as hostile there, if not more so. The Tlingit uh, also attacked the post there. Uh, the upshoot of it is, for most places, the Russian posts became, um, uh, they, were, they were insular, they were controlled, the land around was controlled by Tlingit, by Denina, by uh, maybe by Koniag, probably so, maybe less so in the Aleutian area. The Russians considered the Aleuts conquered people, they considered the Koniag semi-conquered people, uh, they considered the uh, Tlingit unconquered people. So uh, Baranov establishes his post at Sitka and sealed the fate of Russian America because they were unable to feed themselves. So this is a chart from Gibson's book in 1976, part of his thesis that the failure of Russian America had to do with their inability to feed themselves. So here's what they're sending to from uh, Siberia to Alaska. Sheepskin products, um, uh, caviar, but more important foods like rye flour, 361,130 pounds of rye flour in one year. This is one year. Salted beef, 36,000 pounds. Peas, 21,000. Butter, nut oil, and so on down the line. Many of those things that could have been grown in Alaska, at least on a subsistence basis, but weren't because the, Rus the dominant Russian population was in places not suitable for agriculture, meaning Kodiak Island and uh, southeast Alaska at Sitka. Uh, the Russians were well aware of their inability to feed themselves uh, and as a consequence only had about six to seven hundred Russians in Alaska at any one time because they couldn't get any more food over. The uh, food was shipped uh, uh, across the North Pacific. Much of it rotted, much of it spoiled, and there just was a limitation in food more so than anything. There were people to come, but not food to feed them in a Russian manner. So they were aware of it. Uh, part of the reason for establishing Fort Ross about 50, 60 miles north of San Francisco was to establish agri an agricultural colony. So the thinking was to grow grains and potatoes and whatever else at Fort Ross and then ship it back north. The other reason for Fort Ross was to sort of put a, a barrier from uh, Spanish expansion north. But the primary reason was as an agricultural colony. Peter Kalifornsky's great-great-grandfather, Cotton was one of the workers sent to build Fort Ross in 1818. And on the Denina language website, there's a Cotanulchin's, what Peter calls, homesick song, his blues, was, uh, is available for you to listen to. I, I sort of, there's the fort up here on the hill, and I sort of have this fantasy, uh, romantic image of a lonely, sad Cadenalchen 
sitting on one of these rocks and th singing to himself that homesick song. Another dark night has come over us. We may never return to our home, but do your best in life. That is what I do. Cotton Olson did return home uh, eventually uh, and, uh, and lived a productive life, taking the name Nikolai Kalifornsky, the original Kalifornsky. But the agriculture didn't work. So there are places suitable for subsistence agriculture, at least in Alaska, not southeast because the soil is poor, it rains, it drizzles too much, not Kodiak, same thing. But uh, parts of the Kenai Peninsula, parts of the Matanuska Valley, parts of the Tanana Valley are places where subsistence agriculture is possible. Here's a few images. This is Virgil, Virgil, Virgil Dollar's Oats field in Sterling in the 1950s. Here's a barley crop in Fairbanks area. Uh, here's a hay crop in the Matanuska Valley. Spelled Matanuska wrong. Sorry about that. Matt, uh, new, Matt, Matt, uh, that's a U. Matanuska, sorry. A hay crop. So it is possible. Uh, many of these places became more profitable for subdivisions than they did for uh, agriculture. Here's a modern uh, commune called Ionia. It's not far from where I live uh, in Kasilov. And uh, here's their barley crop. And they are developing barley to grow. Uh, now they are, this is 2000, so 13 years later, they've got pretty good at it. Uh, when I last visited, they said they were going to sell some of their barley to a brewery uh, in Homer to have, a, if they can get hops in Alaska, they would then have an entirely uh, Alaskan product. So the point being that subsistence agriculture is possible, and of course vegetables are relatively, e relatively easy to grow. And here's cattle. These are cattle. Uh, this is an agricultural report from 1914, but this is progenitors of this herd are said to have been brought to Kenai Peninsula 100 years ago, and they're pastured here and fed local hay. Um, it would be very interesting, by the way, to try to track and see if any of that strain of cattle are still there in Nanilchik. So subsistence agriculture is possible, but Baranoff picked the wrong place to do it. Uh, this was highly criticized by uh, uh, Koslitsov, uh, Sergei Koslitsov, who was a Russian official who was sent in 1860 to survey the colonies to try to figure out what was going on and whether or not they should, uh, Russia should sell Alaska to what turned out to be the United States. So Koslitsov writes, Cattle boarding in the colonies stands at a very low grade. Experiments have shown that agriculture cannot be successful on the islands, meaning Sitka and Kodiak, but with regard to the mainland of America, the inspector, that's him, notes that the country is adapted to permanent colonization and especially the Kenai country is remarkable for its moderate climate, fertile soil, rich pasture, and abundance of forest and game. Uh, and had he known about it, he could have included the Matanuska Valley and the Tanana Valley there as well. Later he writes, the company, however, when urged to colonize this part of their domains, has answered that the Kenai country was, quote, entirely unfit for settlement, and that in many places the climate was injurious to humans. So they're kind of covering themselves, but they, of course, were wrong. And uh, so we can kind of play this game. What would have happened had the Denina not attacked? What would have happened if uh, Baranov had chosen Kenai or somewhere nearby as his mainland capital and developed subsistence agriculture and the population grown, grown much larger than it did? So 
Let's talk then about the influence of the Battle of Kenai. So for the duration of Russian America, there were very few Russians. This should actually drop. This is when the Battle of Kenai occurs. In, uh, in Cook Inlet, very few. Six, ten, this is actual census data of what I've been able to find out. This is the initial occupation by the Lebedev and the Shelikov Company. Uh, this is smallpox, and we'll talk about smallpox in the next lecture. Um, so this identifies about 1,600 to 900. This is probably for the Kenai River because the records are, uh, are referring to Kenaichi. Uh, the total population was at least four to 5,000, maybe as high as 10,000. So uh, Russia sold Alaska because of the, in part because of the inability to feed themselves. Got the D there, boy. Inability to feed themselves and because of the presence of gold. So um, in the 1830s, I'm going to skip to the next slide, uh, which actually, actually illustrates something else. But in the 1830s, uh, Derotion, a mining engineer, was sent to survey the peninsula. And he found traces of gold. And this is Vosnesensky's 1842 map. This is the Kenai River right here. And this says gold-bearing gravels. Gold-bearing gravels right there. So I'm going to back up and uh, gold. So in 1849, the California gold rush occurred and thousands of mostly men made their way to San Francisco and Northern California for gold. I don't know the numbers. You could, you could Wikipedia that if you wanted to. So uh, in Alaska, we have the Russians fighting themselves with some gold. So they suppressed the information of gold because they knew they would be inundated with gold seekers coming north, American gold seekers coming north, overrunning their meager 600, 700 population in a very short time, and they would be left with nothing. Had Baranov chosen Kenai, uh, for his mainland capital, that number six to seven hundred would undoubtedly have been higher. Had they discovered the Matanuska Valley, the Tanana Valley, much higher yet. So, unbeknownst to them, when the Denina made the choice to attack back in 1797, they were changing the course of North Pacific history. Uh, they, you never wanted. Uh, engage in war lightly. But when people make choices for ethically correct reasons, they can change the course of history for the right reasons, and I believe that's true. If I didn't believe that's true, I wouldn't study this, and I wouldn't teach, and I wouldn't have uh, an optimistic view for the future despite all of the problems that we have today. Denina maintained sovereign control of their homeland until the early 20th century. That's human agency in history. That's decisions people make um, having, making a difference. So a couple of other things to talk about. So this is back to that Vosnesensky map. Vosnesensky was a true naturalist. He came uh, to describe plants and animals and people. And this is his map. He uh, sent the information to Constantine Gruink. And uh, Gruink published this map under his name. But Gruink himself never came to Alaska. Vosnesensky did. His journals are, are in St. Petersburg, Russia. And part have been published. He was in Sitka. He was in Kodiak. The part for the Kenai Peninsula, however, is too faint to read. So someday somebody's going to get a grant to tap into the um, 
the, uh, I don't know what it would be, FBI technology to bring out faint, uh, faint ink and we'll be able to read those journals, I hope. And that's a good project for somebody. So this was Woznozenski. The scribbling on this in red is Jim Carrey's and mine notes uh, on place names, potential place names that Woznozenski recorded. And uh, so that we, he was, Jim was able to uh, figure out a couple of place names. So why is there a picture of vodka over here? So uh, Woznozenski went up the Kasilov River with Denina and he called, uh, he labeled the Tustamina Lake Tustamina Sea. Sea is lake in, in German. So the map was published in German, though he himself was Russian. And uh, up here, just a little bit off your chart here, he labeled the highest mountain in the Kenai uh, Mountains truly truly mountain and it's still on the map says truly mountain but it's uh, it's deri de derived from the Denina word truly remember the t the d's become t's uh do for Denina to do becomes tustumina becomes tustumina as we say it today in this case truly became truly and uh is is sort of uh, interesting that you can just sort of envision him here in a boat or maybe he actually went up I don't know uh, uh, with Denina men and he's pointing up what's that highest peak there what's that called and so in translation they say well it's, uh, it's called a mountain Traily <laughs> so he writes down Traily with a T so it's actually mountain mountain literally I wonder if Wozniczewski ever was clued into that. Uh, recently, this is 2013, uh, I think in late 2012, an uh, entrepreneur uh, took the name Truly for a vodka, Truly Mountain Vodka. So that's now appearing in Cook Inlet liquor store shelves. So, a last couple of slides. Uh, the last ditch effort in uh, Cook Inlet for the Russian America company was to develop a Russian coal mine at uh, Port uh, in uh, Port Graham and so here is that mine here's the woodcut of it uh, and it was established in 1855 and operated 10 years to 1865 this is what the bay looks like I'm standing about here, I'd say, to take this picture down here. And it's located here, the mine at Coal, Coal Cove. Homer is up here someplace. So this is Kachemak Bay. The um, mine was um, developed uh, by an employee of the Russian-American company named Yalmer Fuhlheim. His brother, for, I forget his brother's first name, Fuhlheim, was the, at, the top, at the time one of the last governors of Alaska, of the Ru Russian-American company. Uh, so they, um, I don't know if that's how Yalmer got his job or not, but he has an interesting story. He both were, of course, uh, Russian-speaking uh, pardon me, um, Finnish, uh, Swedish-speaking Finns. I'll get it right eventually. Swedish-speaking Finns. They were from Finland, but uh, spoke Swedish as their language. There's a part of Finland that is uh, Swedish-speaking. And Yelmer, <coughs> excuse me, Yelmer was highly trained. He had gone to um, the University of Helsinki, and uh, had a degree in um, science, natural science, or something like that, and had gone on to uh, a college in Germany to study mining. So he was uh, effectively had a maybe a master's or a PhD level uh, training in mining technology. So he was very highly trained, 
and his first job was in the Ural Mountains in Russia and worked on a mine and he uh, met a local girl and he fell in love. I don't know what she looked like but in my sort of image she was a beautiful Russian woman, Anna Karenina of the, of the Urals, and she dumped him. She dumped him. Maybe he was a little too nerdy for her. I don't know. I'm making all this up. But she did dump him. That we know. And he did what a lot of Alaskans have done after getting dumped by their significant other. They go to Alaska. So he signed on uh, to work for the Russian America company as a mining engineer to develop the mine. And he first traveled to California uh, where he and Deroshan, the original uh, person who had surveyed the Kenai Peninsula, uh, observed what was going on in the mines, in uh, the gold mines in California, but also noted there was a great need for coal. And so Fuelheim developed the mine here at Coal Bay. He had 90 workers of, for whom he was highly critical. He said they were lazy, they didn't know which end of a shovel to use. It was very difficult. Clearing the land was, was hard enough because these are big trees down there in Kachemak Bay. Um, he did have native workers, uh, Lutig and perhaps some Denina. He was very... Um, uh, appreciative of them, and the Russian priest who visited the area said they were treated quite well. Uh, but the mine failed. So uh, this, uh, oh, let me back up before it fails. So this is was my visit. I was there with a couple of Russian archaeologists a couple of years ago, courtesy of Dave McMahon, who was the state archaeologist, and we uh, looked over the area. Um, this, so this picture is taken just offshore. So as near as I can tell, this building would have been about here. And this is the mine entrance, one of the mine entrances, and it's about here. We could stick our head in and see where that was, but didn't want to go too far. It had collapsed by and large, and I think this is about in this area here. It's private property today, so uh, you you don't you can go to the beach, but you can't go up on the private property without the invitation of the landowner. So that's the mine. It operated for, as I said, 10 years, but was a failure. It only shipped one load of coal. In 1856, the company made its shipment to California, to the, to the gold fields. 800 tons, a lot, uh, which cost $15 per ton to mine and sold in San Francisco for $1.75 a ton not economically viable and wasn't going to get any better because it was cheaper to get coal from Chile and later Vancouver Island for the California markets in the growing city of San Francisco than it was the Russian coal from Alaska which was of a lower grade as well. So for the remainder of Russian America the company mined coal, uh, or for the r remainder of the mine, it mined coal, but it used only used it in Russian ships. So it, they made some money, but not, uh, they didn't make money, but they uh, reduced costs, but uh, it was not viable and eventually was abandoned. Um, Frulhelm himself was, uh, he was very proud of what he did. It was a significant accomplishment. He writes about that accomplishment, but also became quite bitter because had a few decisions been made, like developing the mine earlier and other personnel decisions, getting better personnel to run the mine, they probably could have been a lot more efficient and uh, it could have been a viable operation. As it is, it stands derelict. So Alaska is sold. To the United States. Here's the check. Oops, I'm sorry. One too many clicks there. Uh, $7.2 million. Uh, so two things to talk about there. 
first of all caused Litsoff in a re formal report in both 1860 and 1864 reports that Russia controlled only a small territory around the posts, around Sitka, around uh, Kodiak, uh, and the very really didn't control any of the hinterland in Kenai, for example. So they really only controlled a small land, amount of land, and some native scholars believe that uh, Russia sold a uh, merchant company, not all of Alaska, because they didn't own it. And so 7.2 million looks pretty good from that standpoint. And uh, the fact that uh, they were dumping Alaska, dumping what they, selling what they could before word of, a gold, of gold got out, which would have brought thousands of Americans north. And of course that did happen, but not until around 1900, a little bit before. And uh, so they were trying to get rid of it before they could, they had nothing. The, uh, so that's the end of the Russian uh, control. Really wasn't sovereign control in the sense, <coughs> excuse me, that we think of sovereignty. Um, the Dedina, in their case, maintained their own sovereign control. Uh, in a subsequent lecture, we will talk about the American period and what really changed things for the Dedina was the coming of the uh, can salmon canning industry to Cook Inlet. And that brought people and that changed the sovereignty significantly. So thank you very much. Thank you for listening. And uh, I will do a, a follow-up lecture to this having to do with less the physical acts of resistance to Russian occupation and talk about the shaman wars of Cook Inlet and the way that Denina contextualized the um, occupation of their territory in terms of shaman wars. So again, thank you very much.